Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. Um, so our first presenter is Victoria Holliday. She's a third year neurology resident who did her undergrad and medical school at the University of Kentucky. And then she's been doing her uh, neuro op rotation with us for the last few weeks. Um, she's going to talk to us about a case report on idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Hi everyone, um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today and I just wanted to present with you an interesting case that I shared with um, Dr. Judith Warner and Dr. Arefe Adeshina um, that I saw in clinic with them of fulminant idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So the patient that we saw was a 31-year-old right-handed woman who presented um, with a complaint of headache and vision loss and um, she actually presented to us on day 12 of her um, symptom course, uh, but I wanted to present to you the history as she gave it to us. So on day one of her presentation, she woke up with a new, very severe headache that she'd never experienced before. That was a severe, sharp pain over her occiput as well as pressure over the forehead um, on both sides and was associated with phonophobia and photophobia. Now she did have a history of migraine, so didn't initially think very much of it, but this seemed different. And by day three of her symptoms, she had developed a gray spot in her left eye that was persistent. Her headache had become worse, associated now with nausea and vomiting, and was fairly constant. And then two days later, unfortunately, developed a gray spot in her right eye. The next morning, she presented to the emergency department and was admitted from the emergency department after an MRI of her brain as well as an MRV of her brain that were both read as normal. She had a lumbar puncture that showed an opening pressure of greater than 55 centimeters of water and they removed about 25 cc's of um, CSF at that time. They sent it for standard studies, including a cell count, um, culture, grain stain, protein, and glucose, and all of that returned normal, and she had a transient improvement in her headache um, for about 12 hours. She was started on acetazolamide with the presumption that this was idiopathic intracranial hypertension and discharged home. Unfortunately, that was, um, her improvement was short-lived and she continued to get worse with the gray spots in her left eye continuing to grow larger and severely obscuring her vision. Um, she had a central blind spot that she actually reported seeing hallucinations of things like snakes and insects within that blind spot as well as blurry vision and um, gray spots in the contralateral eye. And then she presented to us on day 12 for evaluation. And um, in talking with her and getting further history, um, the, she did report a weight gain of approximately 30 pounds in the last year, but no exposure to tetracyclines or steroids, no diplopia, and no eye pain. Her physical examination on, at the time of her presentation was a blood pressure of 145 over 99 and a heart rate of 123. Her weight was um, 260 pounds, which was a BMI of 38.4, putting her in the morbidly obese category. And her visual acuity was 20-25 in the left eye, uh, I'm sorry, in the right eye, and 21-25 in the left eye. She had a large APD, a 1.8 log APD on in the um, left eye, but the remainder of her neurologic exam was normal. And this is a photograph of her fundus, and I know it's really hard to see, but this is kind of the best we could get on the day that she presented, um, that demonstrates grade five papilledema, and that was true for her bilaterally. She had um, peripapillary hemorrhages, which um, I hope I can convince you is that dark area right there, but also severe um, disc swelling with obscuration of all of her major um, vessels. She had visual field testing, and this was um, her right eye, which um, just showed some uh, uh, constriction of her visual field, but in her left eye, which was her more symptomatic eye, this was her visual field, unfortunately. She had a very large, uh, she had an enlargement of her blind spot and a severely constricted visual field in the left eye. So with these findings with and the acuity of her presentation, we are, were able to arrange for her to be transferred to IMC um, for a lumbar drain that evening. Um, and she was continued on her Diamox during her hospitalization and on day 14 of her presentation, she um, had bilateral optic nerve sheath fenestrations. She was her lumbar drain was left in postoperatively and set to 10 centimeters of water and she didn't have any CSF drainage postoperatively. So neurosurgery felt that she wouldn't require any further CSF shunting procedures. And on day 16, she had her lumbar drain removed and was discharged home with the cetazolamide 500 VID. She followed up with us four days postoperatively 
and um, her head has been injured for a few days following her uh, procedure, but never quite resolved, and then she was complaining more of a low pressure type headache um, after uh, the procedure by the time that she'd come to follow up with us. She continued to have photophobia and chronophobia, but some improvement in her vision, subjectively more in the right eye than the left eye. Her physical examination on the day of her follow-up was again a hypertensive patient with a blood pressure of 147 over 78 and a heart rate of 89. Her visual acuity was still 20-25 in the, in the right eye and it improved to 20-70 in the left eye, which was significantly better. She was 21-25 when she initially presented. Her APD persisted, was a 1.5 log in the left eye, and she had bilateral improvement in her papilledema, which was um, a stage four. This was her right eye after fenestration, um, which showed some, uh, mi a mild degree of improvement compared to previous, but she wasn't all that severe initially. But this was her left eye. So if you remember, um, I can go back, she had this severely constricted visual field um, initially after, prior to her fenestration, and this was her visual field after fenestration in the left eye. So a significant improvement in her um, visual field following uh, just four days postoperatively after a lumbar drain placement and bilateral optic nerve sheet fenestration. So this patient actually meets criteria for something called fulminant idiopathic intracranial hypertension or malignant IIH. Um, and uh, a paper was uh, published in Neurology in uh, 2007 that helped to establish some diagnostic criteria for this. And the patients have to meet the modified dandy criteria for IIH, but also have acute onset signs and symptoms increased intracranial pressure um, and less than four weeks of onset between their initial symptoms and their se and severe visual loss. Um, she also had rapid worsening of visual loss over the course of a few days, so really she met the last two criteria really in the first week of her presentation. This also from the same paper, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the data that they had that helped them to establish this criteria. Um, it was a retrospective review of idiopathic intracranial hypertension patients at Emory and Vanderbilt Universities, and they looked at all comers um, over 10 years at Emory and three years at Vanderbilt, and um, really only were able to classify 14 patients at Emory and two patients at Vanderbilt as uh, fulminant IIH. And that's between two and three percent of all patients that they investigated, so a fairly rare entity. And then looked at several characteristics of the patients, including their demographics, comorbid factors, presenting symptoms, timing between symptom onset and visual loss, timing between um, their symptoms and surgical treatment, and then time between ophthalmologic evaluation and surgical treatment, their CSF opening pressure, their treatment, and their visual outcome. And what they found was that on average, the interval time between their first symptom onset and their worst vision loss was between seven and 28 days. On average, with, I, with traditional IIH, you could expect anywhere from two to four months to be um, associated with vision loss, but um, this is much quicker, and our patient really fit into the lower end of that category. And all patients ended up having surgical treatment in this study, which um, was either optic nerve, finished, or not optic nerve sheath fenestration or um, some sort of CSF shunting procedure. And in the end, they found out that the visual outcomes were directly related to the timeliness of their treatment. This is a slide pulled directly um, from the paper, and um, the right-hand column is um, visual fields before treatment, before surgical treatment, and the left-hand column is uh, visual fields after surgical treatment. And the top two rows actually demonstrate patients that didn't have a significant improvement um, following surgical treatment, but the bottom two represent more of something that our patient looked like um, in that they had a significant recovery of their visual field following um, surgical treatment. In all cases, uh, out of the 16 cases that they investigated, 14 did have some improvement in their visual symptoms, um, but eight patients remained legally blind. And so th half of them still had vision uh, at least as bad or worse as 2200 in their best eye, or they had a less than 25% 20, uh, 20 restricted visual field in their best eye. And the visual fields remained abnormal in all cases, so nobody recovered 100%. The not legally blind patients um, had a surgery within a few hours to four days of ophthalmologic evaluation, and on average that was two days. Um, and the legally blind patients had surgery within three to 37 days, which um, 
is a large spread, but worked out to be um, on average six and a half days after ophthalmologic evaluation. So even though that's just a difference of a few days, it seemed to make a big difference in terms of their view and outcome. So in conclusion, I just wanted to demonstrate a case of something that's fairly rare for us um, with fulminant or malignant idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And um, to point out that um, speedy management of these patients and, and quick uh, surgical treatment for these patients can make a big difference in terms of their visual outcome. And um, I think the paper from neurology um, that uh, helped to demonstrate that, and I think our patients are a good example of that. Um, I appreciate your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions.